let's take out our Bibles and learn together. Change is coming. The question is, what type of change are you going to experience? Well, take out your Bible and look with me again to this prophecy of Nahum. And in the Hebrew, chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, the reason why it's part of chapter 2 in the Hebrew text is because we see a connection between the good news and judgment. You see, we've all heard the expression, two sides of the same coin. When we speak about judgment, there's that condemnation, but there's also vindication. And that word vindication is a word of victory. So without God's judgment, victory will not be manifested. God destroys that which is in opposition to his purposes. So that which is under his will, those who are submissive to his purposes, they can experience the outcome of his will. It says in our first verse, behold upon the mountains, are the feet of Mevaser. Now, that word Mevaser is one who proclaims good news, but not just any good news, but specifically good news about the redemption. Therefore, when we look at this verse, we're speaking about a kingdom outcome. And we read in verse 1, Behold, Upon the mountains, meaning there's a change of authority. God is going to bring about a change through that gospel. Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of the one who proclaims, and it's a word of good news, who proclaims good news and causes to be heard peace. This word, shalom. And I've said many times that shalom is the outcome of the fulfillment of God's will. Now, what we learn from this first part of verse 1 is that there will never be peace without the gospel. It is through that gospel message that you can experience the will of God. And then notice how it continues. Now, there's a change because what I just read also appears in Isaiah 52 and verse 7. And the context there is redemption. That final last day redemption that gives birth to the kingdom and a celebration. That's why it says in verse 1, celebrate, and it's literally the word for a festival, that Hebrew word chag, a festival, or an appointed time in the verb form. So celebrate, Judah, your festivals. Now, if you've studied the festivals of Israel, you know something. These festivals point to the kingdom and the king. How do we know that? The Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, speaking about many things, but including the festivals. He says, they are a shadow of things coming. And the substance, that is what casts the shadow, the body, is Messiah. So Paul is telling us, the more we understand the festivals of Israel, and they're literally the festivals of the Lord, the more we understand about the kingdom reality and the kingdom. And that's why Nahum, in this context of good news concerning God's redemption, he says, celebrate, O Judah, celebrate your festivals, pay your vows, which means your desires are going to be fulfilled. When you make that commitment, when you submit to God's objectives, there is going to be that glorious outcome. And what is that outcome? Look at how the verse ends. 
for no longer again will pass among you, and it's that same word, that bali ya'al, that wicked counselor, for, for this one will be utterly cut off. So we see a clear message. That gospel brings about the defeat of the enemy, but the vindication of the people of God. And through that vindication, we are going to experience that which is a celebration. That which points to the kingdom promises and the king itself. Now, notice the next verse, probably how your second chapter begins. And there we have an image of the one who bestows that judgment. The one who pours out his judgment upon Assyria. And what we're seeing is God's judgment gives birth to a kingdom reality. Verse 2. The one who scatters, meaning the one who's going to put Assyria in exile. The one who's going to cut off Assyria has gone up before you, meaning in the presence of Assyria. Now, the next part of that verse, we see God kind of mocking the enemy. Because their response is, and they've never been defeated, do some research, that Assyrian empire existed for not just a few decades, not just a few hundred years, but numerous years, for century after century. They felt that they were indestructible. So God says to them, build up, make strong your rampart. Now, that is a word that relates to when a city is laid siege. When that enemy cuts it off, it's a defense. So God says, prepare your defense, look out on the way, strengthen your loins, and the loins speak of one's Vitality, one strength, the origin of his very essence. And he says here, make yourselves strong and adopt power. But that next word for power is the word me'od, which means an exceedingly great power, a supernatural power. What God is saying is this, it doesn't matter what you do, the outcome is for sure. Next verse. Now, as I prepare, my wife and I, we sit down together. We go over things. And I like to know what, what it says in your Bible sometimes. And so I share with her the literalness of the text. And she points out and does her own research to help me to see what some Bibles say. And it's so sad because when you look at probably verse 2 in your Bibles, verse 3 in mine. There's a message of victory and restoration. What it literally says in the word shav, it's where we get the word teshuva for repentance. And repentance is a returning to God. It's not God turning away. It's not a word of rejection as some Bibles, in fact, the King James translates. But it's quite the contrary. It's a word of restoration. Notice what he says. And the context is this. As God defeats the enemy, Israel's going to experience restoration. Israel's going to reap the outcome of God's judgment. How? Look at the verse. For the Lord, He restores the splendor or majesty. It's speaking about a restoration back to glory. God is going to restore us to glory. Now, let's make it Theological. Last week, we arrived from Israel, and one of the first things I did was to record a live stream for an organization in Romania. And the subject was 
predestination. Now, I love that, that biblical concept of predestination. It has nothing to do as the theologians teach. That God has predestined, predetermined, some to be in heaven and some to be in hell. You never find that in the Bible. You never find that concept in regard to the biblical term predestination. Read, for example, sometimes Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. It speaks about the blessed God, and what we learn is this, that predestination only has relevance when you're in Messiah. Did you hear that? Predestination only has relevance when you're in Messiah. And what has God and the word for predestination? pro orizo. It's a word for seeing something ahead of time. And it's usually based upon a pattern. Now, I can remember in seminary many years ago that the example that the professor gave was of his wife. His wife liked to sew. And she says, or he said, that she would go out, buy, remember this, a pattern. And based upon that pattern, you knew what the dress was going to be like. Now, we have that pattern. When it says that we have been predestined, and the Bible says that, we have been predestined, who's we? Those who are in Messiah. It has been predetermined that you are going to be like Him. The Scripture says that he who He is predestined, He is called, He who has called, He has chosen, He has justified, and He has glorified. What does that mean? Well, you know the verse where it says, the good work that He has began, He is faithful to what? Complete. I am going to be like Messiah. That doesn't mean I'm going to be godly or divine. That would be heresy. But it means that I'm going to be like Him. That I am going to reflect as though all believers will do the glory of God. And therefore, what it's saying here in our text is that God is going to restore the splendor, that majesty, and notice the language. Nothing is written by chance in the Scripture. Realize that. Therefore, pay attention to every word. It says that he's going to restore the splendor. It's the word gaon, the majesty to who? Yaakov. And also the splendor of Israel, like that same splendor. Now, you know Israel is a kingdom word, right? Israel is a kingdom word. And Yaakov, that means one who pursues after. And what God is saying here is this, the one who truly perseveres, that one who follows after the things of God, pursues God's will, that one is going to have a kingdom experience. He's going to restore them back to his plans. He says here, now he's turning his attention back to Assyria to show Israel's defeat or Assyria's defeat in Israel's victory. For those who empty out, they have emptied them out, meaning Assyria is going to be made into nothing. And their vines, what do you get from vines? Wine. It is a symbol of joy. And what God is saying is this, those things that Assyria thought was going to bring them joy, happiness, contentment, those very things are going to be used for their corruption. And this enemy, look at verse 4 in the Hebrew, the shield 
of his mighty ones. This is a word for a warrior. Those mighty men of strength of Assyria. Their shields are going to be turned into red, meaning blood. And the strong ones into crimson. And their iron chariots are going to become engulfed in fire. Because this is the day that God has prepared. God has determined, He has set aside a day when He is going to destroy the enemy of His kingdom people. And the verse ends with a statement concerning the cypress tree, which scholars tell us were used for spears. And these spears of the enemies, which is a reference to their weapons, are going to be shaken. Most Bibles say that. In Hebrew, it's the word ra'al, which relates to poison. And when something is poison, it doesn't function well. And what he's saying is the enemy, their chariots, their weapons, they're not going to be a source of deliverance. Verse 5. For in the streets, we'll see in a moment, undeniably, we're talking about the streets of Assyria, specifically Nineveh, the capital. In the streets, the chariot, meaning all their chariots, are going to be in a frenzy. And in the streets, another word for streets, there's going to be chaos. And their appearance is going to be like a torch, meaning they're going to be set upon fire and they are going to be darting about, running about as lightning. For God, look at the next verse. For he will remember his noblemen, meaning the noble ones of Assyria. And they will stumble in their walking they will hurry to the walls, meaning to protection. And they are going to prepare their defense. What God is teaching is this. They can prepare their defense. They can get everything ready. But what is God's judgment going to be like? Look at the next verse. The gates of the rivers are going to be open. And the sanctuary, this is a pagan sanctuary, is going to melt. And then we have a word, I believe the King James doesn't even translate it. It's the Hebrew word, hutzav, which relates to something being stood up. It's probably best understood by the word decreed. And the next word is exile, meaning a serious exile has been decreed by God. A series is going to go up, meaning go up into exile. And her maidservants are going to lead. Now, understand the imagery here. When Assyria was victorious in the past, these young maidens would would go out before the soldiers and they would, would start the celebration. They would lead the victory. But now, notice what it says. These maidens are going to lead as the sound of, some of your Bibles may say doves, it's the word yonim, which means doves. But this same word is going to appear later on in our study and is going to be translated as oppression. And most of the scholars from a rabbinical standpoint see them bringing forth the sound of them being oppressed. You see the change? They used to go forth proclaiming their victory, but now they're going to go forth proclaiming their oppression. Not having oppressed another but them 
being oppressed. And they are going to beat, literally, lavav, their hearts. They are going to understand what that empire was about was not what they were promised. But it is going to be a source of mourning and great regret. Next verse. And Nineveh. Now that's how we know who we're talking about. And Nineveh will be as pools of water. From the ancient time. What does that mean? Old water. Stagnant water. Not ma'im chayim, not living waters. But waters that, that are polluted, contaminated. Ones that you would not drink. One that does not satisfy. This is what this empire has become. And they all flee. And the image is this. That the enemy's coming. And the leadership says, stop. Stop. Don't flee. But no one turns around. Everyone is running. Everyone flees from the enemy. Verse 10. What happens to this empire? Verse 10 in Hebrew 9 in yours. Plunder the silver. Plunder the gold. For there was no end of the contents of wealth. Meaning this. Within the treasuries of Assyria, there was just wealth after wealth after wealth. All the vessels, keep reading, from all the vessels that were desirable. They were like endless. They had great wealth. They had weapons. They were numerous. But they were defeated because God said, enough. Now, the message is this. If Assyria, that dreadful empire, one that was known for being brutal, ruthless, having no mercy upon its enemies, if they were defeated, that defeat spoke to all the world. Assyria was defeated. And God prophesied through other prophets of Israel that he was raising up Nebuchadnezzar. And he said to Habakkuk, write this down, make it plain. Babylon is going to destroy Assyria. They never thought it. No one would believe it, but it happened according to the word of the Lord. What happened? Next verse. It's a word for being empty. Literally, she was made empty and became empty. She was lied to waste. And in the midst of this judgment, it says, the heart melted. The knees staggered or knocked together. And anguish in that same place where there was vitality, power, the very essence. It says, in their loins, there was anguish. And the face of all of them gathered up, and it's a word for pale. Not dark as some Bibles translate. What it's saying is Assyria became sick, lifeless, and eventually was no more. But notice how this chapter concludes. See, the image that Assyria had for itself was of a mighty lion. Power, rule. The roar which would intimidate. This was Assyria. That mighty line. But notice what it says. Where is the lion's den? 
that word where should be applied to the next part as well, as well. And the place of feeding, feeding the young lions, the powerful lions. It's a different word. Arye is a normal lion, but a young lion who's strong and mighty, who is in its prime, is called a kafir. So it plays in the place that the young, mighty lions were fed. Where is that? And the lion that walked, both the male and the female lion that walked together. It says, there, there was the lion's cub. Once, there was no one to make the lions fearful. They wouldn't tremble. They wouldn't be concerned or fearful of anything. But things have changed. God's judgment brings about a change that the world could never anticipate it. One that the world would never think would be. This is what Nahum is telling us. Verse 12, 13 in Hebrew. Still focusing in on this symbol of the lion. The lion tears. Now this is a word for hunting prey and hunting successfully and tearing that prey, that, that, that carcass into pieces and giving it to its young. And it says, the lion tears enough for its cubs. And then oftentimes the image is of a lion biting the neck of another animal. And through that line biting down, that other animal suffocates. And this is what's said in the text. And the lion suffocates for his lioness, meaning that male lion kills for his mate. And he fills up with prey, meaning food, holes, meaning in the lion's den, there's place for that provision. And it was known as a den. His den was known as a place of provision. It's that same word that appears over and over. It means to tear another animal into pieces in order that it might be consumed. That's Assyria. That's what it was known for. It was a barbaric empire that tore up the enemy and profited from it for centuries. No one could see or believe that Assyria would, would be no more. But Nahum says it. He prophesies. Why? Because God is going to be comforted. There was nothing in Assyria that was pleasing to God. Nothing in their character. They looked, and what they wanted, they took. What they wanted to do, they did. And they gave no regard to anything that was related to God. Now, this is that same empire that, a little over a hundred years, heard the words of Jonah and sought God's grace and was spared. But that mercy, they forgot. They didn't pass it on to the next generation. They didn't instill that into their children. And now, God was pronouncing His judgment. A judgment where Assyria would never rise up again. That's God. He's able to do just that. Look at the last verse of chapter 2. God is speaking, and He speaks a word of, of attention. He says, Behold, I. This is saying, No other one did this. I did it. Verse 14 in Hebrew. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. This term for God, speaking of His power 
and His righteousness. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will burn up your chariot. This was the source of power. This was how they conquered others, their military. Chariot, just a word that relates to the military power of Assyria. And God says, I will burn up the chariot in smoke. And you're, and this is a reference to their mighty men, but he uses that same word, that kafir. For a strong, young, powerful lion who's in its pride. He says here, And your soldiers will be consumed with the sword. And I will cut off from the land, meaning the land of Assyria, provision. That place that was known, same word in the previous verse. That place that was known as the land of abundant provision. The Assyrians, they never worried about not having. They had an unbelievable supply. It was, some would say, the wealthiest empire in all of history. But that wealth, that power, didn't save them. It didn't deliver them from the judgment of God. Why? God says, I will cut off your provision from the land and no longer shall be heard again the voice of your messengers. What is he talking about? Well, when Assyria was victorious. They would send their messengers, their heralds, back to their empire throughout the major cities, and they would go pronouncing, proclaiming that message, Assyria has triumphed. Assyria Assyria has been victorious. And what God is saying is this, you will never hear any more That message of victory. That message of triumph. Because God is going to utterly consume this empire. Did He? Yes, He did. Has that empire ever risen again? No, it has not. All of this should scream to you and me, the reader, knowing the Word of God and knowing history. God's Word is truth. God's prophecy has been fulfilled or will be fulfilled. Never think that God is not going to accomplish His Word. See, Assyria, God was gracious. He sent Jonah with that message, I am going to bring change in 40 days to this location. They changed but they were not committed. They believed, but they didn't believe consistently. They, because of fear, accepted the message, but that message didn't produce any lasting change. Now, of course, this is Old Testament. We're not talking about the grace of God through Messiah. That grace causes us to be a new creation. That grace promises us what God has begun, He will complete. This is the Old Testament. These are patterns and symbols and signs. But the message needs to be heard. And that is those who are casual about the grace of God. Those who do not value the mercy of God. Those who are not transformed by the truth of God. God will bring upon them His consuming judgment. Their name will be cut off, never to be heard from. They will be defeated, and that defeat, they will never ever be able to rise 
from. See, our God is an eternal God. God is going to work in a specific way forever. Either eternal blessing or eternal curse. Either there's going to be eternal life or eternal death. Things do not come to an end, an absolute end. Read what Daniel says in Daniel chapter 12. There's coming a resurrection. A resurrection of life where some will shine gloriously and there's going to be in others that are going to rise to everlasting shame and contempt. No position in the middle. Why? God says either be hot or cold. Don't think that you can be lukewarm and be pleasing to God. This message from Nahum is a call to commitment. It is a call to being zealous. And let me wrap up this evening by saying this. We didn't meet here in Orlando for two years. We met last year, but the two years prior we didn't because we were told we couldn't. And for the most part, the believing community capitulated. They did not value God's word. They forsook the assembly of ourselves together. We took our orders from man and we stopped listening to God. Tragic. Several people have said it's not original with me. Several people have said this so-called pandemic, and I know people died. I know it affected many seriously. But literally, a pandemic? I don't think so. And we allowed fear, both fear of our health and fear of what the government might do to cause us to listen, not to the leadership of the Spirit, not to the commandments of God, but to the world. We did not stand in a glorious way. We were not that salt and that light that we were called to be. We are going to be challenged again. How are we going to do? Are we going to be committed to the instructions of God? Or are we going to allow ourselves to be intimidated because of fear of what we might lose? I've been saying many places because... You know, we just don't have a conference once a year in Orlando. We have conferences now all over the world. And what I've been sharing is this. What is God's message? We were so blessed when we went to Indonesia a few months ago. You know what Indonesia is? The largest Muslim country in the world. Now, when we arrived, we went to a congregation. They had mo more shofars there than Holy Land Marketplace. <laughs> they had menorahs painted on the wall, did they not? They were lovers of Israel. And we had the opportunity to teach at a school that had, and someone said to me in the right, someone asked me today, why is it? that the people that come to your conference are so old. <laughs> True. But when we were in Indonesia, we saw a school of 800 students that were young. And they came to faith. They came to faith. Not because God sent a preacher, but because God called. They had dreams, and I've heard of this, and I was always skeptical. 
But the pastor of this congregation, he said, people come to our place. They've had dreams. They had visions. They're bothered. They don't know. But they said, we know that we have to change. And we were told, you can tell me how. And we see these young people studying God's word, wanting to know the truth about the God of Israel. Now, they're where? In the largest Muslim country in the world. And you know what I don't see there? Fear. I see a passion. I see a commitment. And I'm wondering, is it the same God that they believed as we in America have believed in? Because it seems that he's working very differently there than he is here. Here's the message that I share with conferences. The message for you and me in the last days. Very simple. Not my words, Messiah's words. When he says, pick up your cross and follow me. I'm not a prophet, but I'll tell you something. You are going to be challenged maybe much sooner than you think. Whether you're going to pick up your cross and follow him or run away. Say that cross, you didn't really understand it. This is not what you signed up for. If you're a true follower, you'll pick up that cross. You'll follow him because you know whatever happens to this body, whatever happens to your possessions, so what? So what? Why? Because I'm going to get a new body. And we who are believers, we have eternal blessings in the kingdom. All these things here are temporal. We have an a individual that heads up our Eastern European office. His name is George. One of these conferences, he's going to be here. And George is building a home. And he says, tick, 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 tick. Says, what do you mean? He says, I know something. It's just a matter of time before I'm not living in that house, but I'm on the street. He's right. He understands there's a time coming when we're going to lose everything. But what does the scripture say? When we lose everything, when we're willing to lay down our life, we find our life. We need a different perspective.